everyone, welcome back to my channel and if you're new here, like, subscribe, do that amazing stuff I will drop my social media handle right down here below You can follow me on Instagram, Maddie Violet, Facebook, Maddie Violet, Snapchat, MaddieGoodos91 and on TikTok, Maddie Violet, no, Violet Maddie 91 where I do post weird and unusual facts from around the world But with all that being said, let's just do it Dive right into today's story. Ba, ba, ba. Warning, the following content may contain scenes and imagery of which viewers may find disturbing and very traumatic. Your discretion is advised. So today's uh, story is about a lady here called Suzanne Kappa. And this, uh, this case, her story, takes place in Manchester. Yeah, we're going to Manchester again like we did last week. And this lady here, she, uh, you know, she had an interesting family background. I couldn't scoop up much, but here's just, you know, a snippet, basically. Her family upbringing was very different to others. Her father remains unknown. And her mother and stepfather, they were married for a fair few years, but then later divorced. But, uh, Suzanne here and her sister, they chose to live with their stepfather. She would, however, be living at both her parents' house in Manchester. She'd be going back and forth between her stepfather's and her mother's house. Staying at both. Suzanne had started mixing, you know, with the neighbourhood as you do. I mean, when you're in a neighbourhood full of people, you do tend to get to know them or just generally say hi as you walk past. That's exactly what Suzanne did. She actually became friends with a, uh, a lady called Jean Powell here. Now Jean Powell, ooh, she is an interesting character. So Jean here had a very different family uh, unit kind of going on. Mm, yeah, she did. She lived with her three children and a uh, a lady called Bernadette McNeely. I hope I pronounced that right. She was 24 and she also had three children. So what a weird kind of living situation. But yeah, they all lived under the same roof and it was very crammed. Now Jean here, she uh, was quite the interesting character. She would have her ex-husband, Glenn Powell, 39 over. Powell's younger brother, Clifford Hayes, who was 18. Anthony Dudson, 17. Jeffrey Lee, 26. Now, uh, Jeffrey and Anthony here, they, uh, well, let's just say, they are both, not necessarily at the same time, I don't know, but they had sexual relations with Jean and she would sleep, you know, with them both, generally. Just both them on the go. And here's the weird part. Hmm. So, with Jean being in this house with Bernadette, her three children, and obviously Jean's three children. Now, uh, Bernadette here, her boyfriend was Anthony. Yeah, Anthony, who was sleeping with Jean. But, uh... They just didn't mind and go on with it. It's such a weird dy dynamic, really strange. Jean and Bernadette were not great people, not the best of cookies, uh-uh. They would be involved in various legal activities, so drugs and stolen car parts, which in the long run would actually cause a lot of arguments and fights between their neighbours, as you can imagine it would. Suzanne's sister Michelle, she actually stayed at a uh, Jean's house here, but she had actually decided to move out in late night too, due to the fact that uh, she found Jean's new friends, aka Bernadette, rather evil and did not like them and just went out, and that's exactly what she did. When Bernadette did actually move in uh, to Jean's house, obviously it was so crammed, having six children and two other adults. And because it was so crowned, they had actually uh, had their bedroom set up downstairs in the dining room and they'd shared a bed together. Wow. But you know, me you know. Whatever floats your boat, right? Suzanne would regularly stay at Jean Powell's house, despite the fact that Jean and Bernadette here, this one mean girls kind of comes into it, they were horrible to her, they would bully her. But Suzanne, you know, she just wanted to be their friend and she just tolerated it, which is, is crazy. I mean, so much for friendship, right? Your friends don't bully you or pick on you or be mean to you. It's 
special not like that anyway. Michelle had said that it's not that Suzanne is scared of Bernadette and uh, Jean here. No. It's the fact that she wanted to, you know, she would do anything for them. She would do anything to them for them to make them happy, even if it meant them being mean to her. In November 1992, Bernadette's uh, boyfriend here, Anthony Dudson, and I'm trying to laugh so I'm saying this, had caught uh, pubic lice. <laughs> that is so gross, but oh god. Ugh. Yeah, he had caught pubic lice and decided to shave it all off in the hope that it'd go away, I suppose. You gotta think, I mean, he's sleeping with Jean too. Do they not put the two and two together? No, they don't. They go blame someone else, right? Bernadette had told her Anthony here that she thinks he may have caught it from Suzanne. Bear in mind, nothing ever went on between Suzanne and any of the, the males that were ever in this household. On one occasion, Suzanne here was lured to Jean's house where uh, they were all waiting for her. This is pure evil what they do to her. She literally takes one step through that door and they grab her the moment her foot's in and pin her down and Anthony here decides shave her head. So he shaved her head. Just, that's just horrible to do somewhere, it really is. That's just, that's just so mean. He then shaved off her eyebrows and they made her clean up her own hair and put it in the bin. Glenn Powell, aka uh, Jean's ex-husband, he had actually put a plastic bag over Suzanne's head and then continued to walk around her while hitting her in the head. She was kicked by Bernadette and Jean as she was laying curled on the floor and they were taking turns to beat her and then they decided to use a wooden instrument and a belt to hit her with. And just as things are getting horrid, they get more horrid as they do in these cases. They have taken Suzanne into the bathroom to then shave up her own pubic hair. Oh, is this just... I mean, that's just degrading. Just leave the poor girl alone. So after all of this, they decided, you know what, let's go shove her in a cupboard. And that's exactly what they did. They had left her in this cupboard overnight, and the very next day, Suzanne was taken out of this cupboard and taken upstairs to another cupboard where she was locked away again. Oh, so far this is just, this is brutal. Jean and Bernadette's children were disturbed and, you know, they kept being disturbed because they kept hearing Suzanne's crying and you gotta think, with children in the house, it's not exactly the wisest of ideas to even... No, just have them around that. They're gonna see something or hear something, you know, they're not completely stupid. I'm not saying kids are stupid, but you know what I mean. They know! On the 8th of December, they decided to move Suzanne into Bernadette's house. Now, I had to really dig for this one because I didn't understand at this point how did we go from Bernadette to living with Jean? Wow, she originally moved into the neighbourhood and then moved in with Jean. But then how would she still have her own house? Lord knows. But she does still have her own house, just chooses not to live in it and chooses to live with Jean and a crowned house full of kids. Now they, uh, they decided when they took Suzanne to Bernadette's house, this is literally where I guess medieval kind of gruesome, they decided to tie her up onto this old, disgusting bed spread eagle style and for love of god don't do me don't search up on the internet because a load of 18 plus images of adult stuff is gonna come up and i tried to find a medieval picture of it just so you guys would know what it looked like but nada i couldn't find squat so for those of you who know what medieval spread eagle is and then you'll know but yeah it's just so degrading so she was tied up spread eagle and she was on a up 
turned bed in a back room of the house. Over the next several days, Suzanne would face a lot of like violent, seriously violent attacks and they would be severe and they would be continuous. There would be a series of them. It wouldn't end until it did end. She was regularly beaten, injected with amphetamines and she... Uh, they burnt her with cigarettes. They uh, they had this method in their head that they thought would be amazing to do on this poor girl, which I think is just enough to turn someone completely insane. Like, I mean, gone. Completely gone. So they decided they would put headphones on her, turn the volume up on full blast, and then she'd hear the words, Hi, I'm Chucky, wanna play? Everyone remembers that Chucky film, right? Well, imagine that full blast volume in your ears. I don't know whether they put it on repeat or not, but I know that it did traumatize the hell out of her. And uh, Bernadette, she would find this somewhat of amusing to the point of where she would quote the lines from the actual Chucky films directly at and to poor Suzanne here. Later on that week, Jean and Bernadette's friends Clifford and Jeffrey had popped over to uh, Bernadette's house. Now they had noticed Suzanne tied up and out the back. They'd seen that she had been blindfolded and gagged. By this time, Suzanne had been there for quite some time and she was laying in her own urine and feces and oh, it was just horrible. Now they did give her a bath, they put disinfectant in it, but they used a brush rough and horrible enough to literally remove your skin. I mean like proper like, it wasn't even a case of making the, drink, the skin dry, it was probably like ripping it off. Ooh. So Clifford here decided to take the item that they used to gag her with, they took it out of her, he took it out of her mouth and he I can't take it seriously because it just sounds like such a chubby line. He says, Right, I'm gonna take your teeth out. I don't know why I did a London accent. I mean, I am from London and the accent sometimes comes out. Even though this is in Manchester, so imagine it in a Manchester accent, which I cannot do, sadly. Clifford here proceeded to try to take her teeth out. He tried hitting them at first, I would say like his first attempt. And then he tried tugging them, wasn't getting anywhere. And then he grabbed Suzanne's head and then tried tugging the teeth. And they did eventually come out, but they snapped in half and it chipped. So he then continued to try and wrestle her teeth out with these pliers. She just stood there for God knows how long, failing attempts after attempt after attempt. Until he eventually did rip them out and then he would start over again and take more of her teeth. Now uh, later on he did actually keep her teeth as a souvenir and police did actually find it in his own home a lot later on. And during this time there was actually one witness. Yeah, there was a witness. Now this one witness did actually see Susan at the back tied up blindfolded and did have a, uh, you know, a moment of where he was talking to her. But um, this conversation wouldn't really last because he just, you know, refused to help her. That's all she wanted from him was him to help her get out of there. And he was too scared of Anthony and what he'd do to him and just get a beaten, which is just such a cowardly, you know, thing. But that's just how it was, sadly. And sadly, this witness wouldn't come forward until much, much later when it was too late for poor Suzanne here. Here's a bit of a, an interesting one. So get this right. Now this is super just taking the pee cheeky as F. Like, you gotta be effing kidding me. Now, uh. Jeffrey and Anthony decided to help Suzanne's sister's fiance, Paul, here with his car. They helped him do some repairs on it, which is just. What is wrong with you? Seriously? You're messing with the victim, now you're going to the family, mm. no. Yeah, they, they just, just the fact that they did that and found out full well, Suzanne is back there, the poor thing. It's just, it's so sickening. 
Paul's later said that if he could have, if he known what he knew now back then, he would have helped Suzanne get out of there and he would have taken those who were involved in the back of that room for 10 minutes and I'm guessing to kick the, you know, the absolute shite into them. It wasn't long until Susan's family had actually got real worried and they were going to report her as missing. And Jean and Bernadette caught wind of this information and they started to panic and they decided, you know what, we need to move Suzanne. We've got to move her somewhere else because she can't stay here. And that's exactly what they did. On the 14th December 1992, in the early hours of the morning, Jean and Bernadette here decided to take Suzanne out of the house and just save her a little road trip early hours of the morning in the boot in a stolen white Fiat Panda car. Of course they wouldn't steal it, I mean why wouldn't they right? She was driven 15 miles to a narrow lane at Werneth, Werneth Low near Romley on the outskirts of Stockport. Bernadette Jean, Anthony and Glenn had laughed the entire journey about their horrible plan and what they had in mind for her. It is just disgusting. Jean would later on say that Suzanne was pushed down an embankment and uh, Bernadette here had poured petrol all over her. Bernadette had a lot of difficulty igniting the, uh, the petrol that is and so disturbing. They had tried many attempts. Anthony and Glenn jumped in to attempt it and they did eventually manage to set her alight. Poor Suzanne here was on fire and burning and they were laughing and just being pure evil. They found it disturbingly highly amusing. And Bernadette here decided to take one massive deep breath in and start singing away. Not quite like the singing birds or anything, no. She decided to start singing Burn, Baby, Burn. And that song stuck in my head. Oh god. But yeah, she would continuously mock, laugh, and sing this while poor Suzanne was on fire and burning. They believed that Suzanne was dead, and when believing this, they said, Oh, let's just uh, go home, and on the way, we'll get the drinkies in and uh. Celebrate if you get your cocktails and get the shots rolling, get the beers and get the crazy looking absinthe and just other beverages of any kind to celebrate with, right? But what they didn't realise that when they left, Suzanne here was miraculously, by thread, still alive. She had severe burns, like really bad. But she miraculously managed to pick herself up and stumble her way down a long road. Suzanne was found around 10 past 6 in the morning by a man and his other colleagues and they found her in such a horrific state. They immediately took her to a nearby residence where they rang an ambulance. The residents had said both of Suzanne's hands appeared like ash, her legs were just like raw meat and her feet appeared to be badly charred. They wanted to comfort her but she would pull away as the pain was too much to bear. Her head was shaved, there was recent cuts to her head, her face was almost featureless, her hands were red raw, black at the fingertips and her legs were red from top to bottom. Suzanne had drank six glasses of water literally chugging one after the other after the other but she struggled to hold them because her hands are so badly burnt she couldn't hold the cup herself. Suzanne was rushed to hospital where she'd managed to give all six of the names of the, you know, nasty son of a beeps. But uh, she ended up going into a coma and sadly she never woke up. I mean, it kind of sounds like to me that I don't know, she was given a chance to quickly explain something before she went. That way she could have some peace, she could have, you know, something. They were actually able to identify her by a fingertip and you think, well, I thought they were burn off. No, 
there was one, her thumb was actually still intact and still able to, you know, identify her by her, I suppose, thumbprint. And that's how they identified who she was anyway and obviously that's how her parents found out and it, they were devastated. On the 18th of December, Suzanne had sadly passed away, which is pretty horrible and, you know, very sad. And on the 14th of December, around half seven, the police were instructed to go straight to Jean's address and uh, arrest them, bring them in. The thing is though, they weren't, you know, necessarily told to arrest who. They were instructed to arrest them all, arrest every single person that was at that address. Jean and uh, Bernadette here, they laughed the whole time while they were being arrested and they were throwing jokes back and forth like as if prison was a holiday. Like, he's not, it's no joke lady. Initially, all six did deny any involvement in uh, Suzanne's murder and the torturing. They, you know, they were trying to like, do the whole, we're innocent, you know, we didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, ball. Beep. Now, uh, Anthony here, he was, uh, you know, put under pressure by his father to come clean about every single individual detail and every single bit of truth as to what he did. He wanted him to come clean or else. And Anthony broke under pressure and he spilled everything. On the 17th of December 1992, the six appeared at the Manchester Crown Court where they were remanded in custody. They were all charged with murder, kidnapping and attempt of murder. Bernadette McNeely was guilty of murder and got life imprisonment with a minimum of 25 years. But uh, in 2013, her sentence was reduced by one year, although she had other charges as well. She was found guilty of conspiracy to cause grievous bodily harm and was given 20 years for this one. She also pleaded guilty for false imprisonment and got another 20 years on top of that too. Jean Powell was found guilty of murder and got life imprisonment too, with a minimum of 25 years. She was also found guilty of conspiracy of grievous bodily harm and got 20 years. She also pleaded guilty to false imprisonment and got another additional 20 years. Glenn Powell was found guilty of murder with life within a minimum of 25 years was also found guilty of conspiracy to cause bodily harm and got 20 years and was also found guilty of false imprisonment and got another additional 20 years like Jean and Bernadette did. And Jeffrey Lee pleaded guilty to false imprisonment but he only got 12 years. He was acquitted of murder, acquitted for conspiracy to cause grievous bodily harm. Anthony Dudson, well, he was guilty of murder, detained indefinitely with a minimum of 18 years. He was also guilty of conspiracy to cause grievous bodily harm. He got 15 years for that sentence. He also pleaded guilty to false imprisonment and was given 15 years for that charge too. And uh, Clifford Pook, what an interesting name eh? He pleaded guilty to conspiracy to cause grievous bodily harm and was given 15 years. He also pleaded guilty to false imprisonment and another additional 15 years. But he was acquitted of murder. Now, I honestly think some of them didn't really get a tough enough sentence, but you gotta think they got charge after charge after charge and well, they're gonna be in prison for. A long time or so you'd think. Some of them did actually get out early. I will like uh, drop like the rest of the information about you know when they got out and what dates on the screen as I'm talking about it, I'll just pop right in my corners. I honestly thought this case was very horrifically uh, shocking to a T. I mean I thought the one I did about Kelly Bates was bad. But this one is just as horrific. 
I mean, there was no eye gouging, or drowning for that matter, I guess. But let me know what you uh, you all thought of that case, and uh, drop your thoughts below in the comments down there. And if you have a case or a story you'd like me to cover, drop it down below in those comments and I will mention you at the end of the video, give you a little shout out. But anyways, uh, until next time.